Um, today we had a wide range of talks uh, ranging from the reasons, like the causes of this um, situation we're currently in, to uh, what situation are we actually in, to uh, what could be done, probably on a more uh, regional level. And uh, I probably would like to start again with the unknown unknowns because that was kind of a overall topic in all of the presentations. Uh, some of you have made concrete um, assumptions about how, how uh, to what extent there is an actual risk that we have to act on. Um, we surely see that uh, there is an actual unknown unknown on which uh, current security politics act on and to what extent do you think this is real? Is this something we can eventually even overcome with um, our conception of uh, basic human rights? Um, let's start with you from left to right. It's probably least. Thank you. Hello? Uh, well, um, I don't think the question is so much if, there's an, if there are certain political issues or certain problems out there. I mean, you heard a lot about, um, about you know, some new issues in, in, in critical infrastructures and new, new, new cyber threat threats and, and also the, the complexity, the emerging uh, complexity between putting different levels and different, um, well, spheres of interaction, if you want. Um, to me, the point is more about how how do we go about it? Is it is it always what what are the what, what are the political consequences we talk we draw from this? How how should we deal with them? And is it is it always a good idea to you know to um, to maximize our preventive measures and to label it as a security problem, or is it sometimes? more adequate to, you know, to take a step back and, and start a reasoned discu discussion, a reasoned political discussion about the, the situation as it is and, and about the fundamental elements of the situation. And, um, well, if, if, we, if we draw on the next, the next step then, and, and uh, you hinted to this, to this um, you know about getting get getting networks and getting technologies again under control, and I think that's that's an important element that we 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 regain control of of um, of these technologies and also the point is less about about you know questioning questioning these 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 problems. It's more about how do we, if, if we, if we, how, how can I say it? If, if, if we approach the problem from, from, from your point of view about, you know, the state should have the control. And we, we shouldn't, I think it's, it's wrong to, to assume that we are, we are living in some, some I don't know, under, undemocratic nightmare state that's always trying to, to get us some, at some, some weak point. Uh, that this is a democratic system, and the point is we should be able to trust in this state and in this system and, and maybe the point is that we need to, 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 to guarantee that this trust is justified, that you know you have transparency and you can, can not only regain state control that, but that you can trust that this control is um, transparent and that it follows constitutional and legal procedures. Okay. Probably there's, there's two different opinions about how far democracy goes nowadays. So uh, I usually um, refer back to the first industrial revolution when I look into a digital revolution nowadays. And I compare because I think it helps if you look back into history. So you can probably tell me whether I'm right or wrong. Um, but in the first industrial revolution, we have seen new technologies coming up in the state which is not prepared to handle those. And um, for example, you, you, you pretty quickly saw that um, people were exploited with regard to their human labor. 
Uh, for example, in the very early days of the Industrial Revolution, children had to work hard and uh, had to also feed their families. So the 10 years old were standing there and were, were working in industry, in early industries. And it took us the whole 20th century, at least in these regions, in the Western regions, to humanize the human labor. And now I think the situation, digitalization, is quite comparable. Um, we, we are confronted with new technologies of surveillance, um, of data analytics, and um, if I compare the human labor with my personal data, then I would say it's quite comparable. Because human labor is something which is existential for my existence as a human. So if I don't work, usually I will not survive. I need to work to earn money. <laughs> Nowadays, so this means that uh, the human labor inherits uh, something from my sub... I don't know what the, the, the proper English term is, but in, in, in our understanding, constitutional understanding, we make a differentiation, we have a dualism between objects, objects which are things that uh, um, are being used by, by economics, for example, objects, things who do not have any rights, a house has no right, and a car has no right, and I have the subjects, uh, and subjects have freedom rights, and people, persons are subjects, and there are uh, also other um, um, uh, institutions who inherit this subject um, property from the person, which is companies are subjects to, and uh, democracies are subjects too. So we have rights here, that's, so we have this dualism. And we see that uh, with big data as the surveillance, um, the, the, the person is not being considered as a subject, but has been made object. Uh, this means I am an algorithm or treated like an algorithm that another algorithm can exploit or analyze or do whatever, what, whatever it wants. So this means that big data is um, violating my rights and therefore it violates the constitution and our idea of human dignity, our European idea of human dignity. So if people understand that dualism, they understand a lot. And, um, and therefore I usually say, okay, please follow me and be aware that what we see here with big data and surveillance, yeah, it might be more than only this, but it's also a capitalistic uh, problem because this idea that I take the subject, the person, and make it an object of economics is the basic error that capitalism has. So I have to do, I have, I have an issue with capitalism also. The capitalism is some, somehow broken. Yeah? Um, so this also means, that gives me hope, because it gives me hope, and I say, um, if I take this standpoint, and I know that I was able to regulate the first, the initial, very first capitalism of the 20th century or 19th century, then there might be hope that I'm also able to regulate this new form of very aggressive capitalism. Um, so, and this is the one thing. And the second thing is, yes, I, 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 do not, I do not really trust in the state, but as a citizen, I go and stand, and I want to enforce the state to adhere to the Constitution and provide me with an infrastructure that does not violate the rights of the person. Because it is, the, excuse me, the damn responsibility of that state. It is written down in our constitution. Uh, and the third thing, as I said before, is that I enforce my team, my technologists, to be aware of what's going on here and uh, to, to, to make them, um, to enforce uh, them to, to, to build in privacy by design or uh, security by design to protect technologically our rights at that level. So this is basically the three levels that I would like to tackle the problem from. Oh, I, I think that's uh, there's a lot of optimism there, and I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> uh, uh, there are states that don't have constitutions that explicitly maintain you know, a particular kind of civil rights or human rights. There are states like Australia that have a... Uh, constitution that is uh, uh, mainly a procedural constitution and then relies on a kind of Westminster approach. Um, the UK is, is similar, although it has, has a couple of different safeguards. So I can't really um, I can't really put a lot of faith in that, even in that legalistic, you know, that liberal legalistic approach to say uh, I, 
I think we can we can enforce things that are in the Constitution. In the Canadian context, of course, there's a very complicated uh, uh, Bill of Rights, and, and it's something that is is um, uh, can cause optimism in in this way. But I like the way that you position this idea about the digital revolution and the industrial revolution because we do produce free labor. We produce free labor just by existing. Every time we, we uh, do something, we're putting this free labor into big data and then big data is moving it all around. So I don't know, I, I, I don't have this optimism. I don't trust the state and uh, I want to go back to lying. I want to lie to the state. I want to lie to big data because I see that that might produce some sort of cracks in the system. Although that's not very helpful for anything other than to have some kind of, you know, anarchist position, uh, which is uh, solipsistic often and, and even quite useless. So I, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that there was um, a very qualitative change in the way the society is set up now compared to uh, situations where we have been in the past because the systems were less complex or less, uh, were easily more compri compromisable again for those that were not comfortable or not uh, winner of those systems. I don't, I don't know if we know that yet. So I don't think we're at a kind of a historical moment or something where we know that. Uh, because what I would say is, that, see, not, not everybody in this room is a uh, uh, mathematician, but we all engage in big data in the same way that uh, you could have said, say, 30 years ago, not everybody in this room, if we were all engaged in this kind of conversation, not everybody in this room would, be, uh, would have the capacity to take apart a car, an automobile, and then put it back together. We have no idea. We just get in the car and drive it. It's just a, a technological innovation that we use. And prior to that, it would be the same about the telephone. So, uh, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, when telephones started to become used in many places, and then eventually in most places, uh, that kind of analog technology was there. But we didn't really understand it. People weren't taking apart telephones and rebuilding them and doing that kind of thing. So I'm not sure that we are in a uh, uh, kind of a space where we have really done something different. Perhaps we have, but uh, I mean we're only going to know that when the apocalypse hits, right? Then it's all too late. <laughs> so, so I don't, I don't really know if we can. Uh, I think those parallels are there. Those historical parallels are there about uh, technology coming into our lives and then changing everything, but. Um, uh, I'm not sure what it actually changes or what it actually does to your everyday existence. Okay, I think I see that change. Um, I see the technology on the one hand because we've built it and we operate it, and the technologies that um, come with big data is artificial intelligence because only artificial intelligence systems are able to make sense or structure these unstructured data which we generate every day. And I see what it makes to exist in conventional businesses in the industry, all these business models, all of them are being challenged heavily. So they really must think in new paradigms to survive. i give you an example. German bank, Deutsche Bank, um, there has leaked a statement which said, if Google gets the banking license, and Google has applied for a banking license, as well as Facebook did, it, as well as Amazon did, um, if Google gets a, a banking license, we're dead. So they know that there will be many users who will switch with their accounts to Google and give them even more data, financial data even. And uh, because it might be cheaper, because the, the interest rates might be low, whatever. Um, so we see that they, they, those, those banks, they must reposition themselves because uh, they're really challenged in all their core competencies. Yeah? Uh, payments, Apple Pay, PayPal. So the, 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 the payment system is challenged. Uh, the the um, investment business is challenged also by high frequency trading, for example. It's machine to machine trading. 80% of all trades in the US are being done machine to machine with big systemic risk because what we observe is flash crashes that happen in millisecond, in nanosecond uh, speed. They are invisible for the eye and only the researchers that sit and do an ex post analysis, data analysis, can basically detect 
Okay, since 2006, we had 18,500 flash crashes and nobody recognized them. Oh, we were just lucky that the markets recovered. And this was really luck. Therefore, I say it's a risk business what we're doing here. Um, so we see, we see really um, the need for paradigm changes in the industries. And of course, these paradigm changes, they also hit us individually. We are also enforced to deal with all this. How do we deal with it? Um, what I see change in uh, awareness, um, when I talk to people, I often hear, and it's quite often from young people, they don't care at all about the freedom rights we're talking to. They say, if it is useful for myself, then they should have all my data. If it is, if I can optimize myself when I provide my data and get advice from an artificial intelligence system that uh, analyzes me and optimizes my day-to-day -day life, then, okay, let them do it. But then this is so naive, sorry guys, because uh, businesses, what do businesses optimize? A business is there to make revenue, to make profit. And they will find business models that improve or that maximize their profits. They're not interest, interested in optimizing our lives. Yeah, this is why I said we're just the object uh, to them. And we are the cause of big accumulation of capital at their end. That's that's fact. And uh, <laughs> so, I, I, therefore, I, I, I always think I'm a dinosaur when I go out and I say, look, this is our constitution, this is our, 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 our rights of freedom rights, and we have them, and you give them all up if you follow this big data uh, business models, and they just don't care, and this is a big change that I really observe, and it, it scares me to death, honestly, because otherwise, you, you, see, the, the, you see in Hong Kong, in the, in the Arabic Spring movement, bloods flowing for those type of freedom rights, and we just give them up just like nothing. I mean, terrible. Yeah, I, I agree as, as well, um, totally, that, that these, these changes are very, very profound. Um, on the one side, the technological changes that you just mentioned, um, I think to me it appears as, as if, we, if we are like Goethe's Zauberlehrling, you know, we, we set certain things were set in motion and now we need to pick up as a society in, 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 in you know, understanding what's happening and also then as a next step after understanding and in, in, yes in regulating these things and um, that also expands to you know to the to cyber security dimension what I mentioned in my presentation this morning <coughs> this multi dimensional complexity that you know it's it's about and at the moment to me it appears as if it's you know we look what what's what we can do and, and we, we try what's what's possible in terms of you know, attacks, cyber attacks and so on, and, and after the damage at some point will be done, then maybe there, there will be some sort of reflection phase and oh, maybe that's not, as, that's not so positive and maybe you should regulate it. But also, um, the second point, um, you've mentioned in your presentation um, Uber and, and the whole, you know, how they proceed with their business and um, it's, it's, I think there's not only a technological dimension but also a societal change and um, it's not about, and it, it goes, maybe it goes along with this American way of doing things like, like pragmatism and, you know, freedom and freedom is more important or freedom goes over regulation and so on and, and this, some, some, especially with Uber, the, the, the business model seems to be disruption. You know, you disrupt existing, existing systems and, and modes of operating and, and you try to impose your own model by disrupting these models. And then after you, know, after you did that, then you, you, bet, you bet that some, some adjustments will be made that ultimately will, that you will be the winner in the, in the end of these adjustments. And maybe I'm not so surprised that Google is investing in Uber because they at some point they had a similar approach to doing business with you know the whole Google Books approach and with copyright and so on. It was like challenging assist existing regulations. And then let's see how far we can get and if, if the if the if the if there's a value for the consumer that's high enough then that sort of justifies what we're doing. So that's that's another change I see. And also if um was my last point. 
Yes, this, this ignorance um, you just talked about. Um, at some point, it, to me, it's astonishing that, that, that these concepts like, like fundamental rights and so on, they, they seem so abstract, even esoteric to so many people that, you know, this, this, this direct relevance to, to your everyday life, that's something that escapes so many people and that's worrying in my view as well. So. It's been said that privacy, you only uh, recognize the value of privacy once it is gone. Then you see what, it value, what its value was. This is in line with what you just said. Um, <coughs> we talked uh, as well about false positives. What, do you, what is your general opinion of false positives? Is it like the main thing we should be worried about? Or is it like uh, just another uh, part of the game that we make a subversi subversive uh, part of if we are against the current developments in surveillance? Well, I, I'm not, I, I don't know about this. I mean, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, what I think will, will eventuate on the one hand is that if we're looking at uh, terrorism and, and this kind of security, uh, it is, as I mentioned in, in my talk earlier, what I think will happen is people will simply buy big chunks of, of uh, uh, data and mess up the giant machine. And that's how these things will happen. Uh, it's not going to be the propaganda of the deed anymore. It isn't going to be blowing up buildings and, and uh, uh, doing that sort of a thing. It's going to be something else. It's going to be something that goes through this this very large uh, big data electronic system to bring down financial structures and things like that. So it isn't even a, 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 a thing about nation states or national attacks or something like this. It isn't that at all. It's going to be this, this kind of next level. However, having said that, um, historically we have had similar problems before and we seem to have adjusted to them. So, um, I'm not sure that, that this is something to worry about. Uh, I'm not sure that we see a situation where there are you know, roving bands of people who are trying to do these sorts of uh, regular and constant cyber attacks that are at a level high enough to be able to globally disrupt this, this whole thing. It doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be the case that we are still adjusting to these things. So there is this kind of... Um, fine line, I think, that we, we have to uh, uh, traverse this idea about not being alarmist and getting on with your daily life on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, being quite aware that, that uh, you know, again, it's an ap apocalyptic vision that it's just possible to collapse the whole system because we are basing it so much and so heavily on this one type of global set of interactions. This is something I fully agree with, by the way. Uh, we have built algorithms for the financial markets, so we're a little bit familiar how it works, the machine-to-machine -machine trading. And this is something that always worried us. We said, okay, this is something if a terrorist attack would, ta would attack the financial system, you could destroy so much value all over the globe. And it is, I mean, um, the, the four brokers, the professional brokers working at the stock exchanges, they know that this is a, a perverse system they are dealing with, this machine-to-machine -machine trading, and they know that could happen. And uh, it will probably happen. We call these the black swans, talking about wild cards, but we, we talk, talk, uh, call it black swans. Um, how can we handle this? Now, sometimes when I talk to politicians, politicians usually talk about uh, regulation. Okay, and I'm d'accord because I'm also a lawyer. So this is something where I say, okay, I have, I deal with a digital quantitative system that maximizes profit all over the world. Um, I have to somehow regulate it and from an analog standpoint and qualitative, which a law is a qualitative uh, regulation. Uh, this is one thing, but I'm also asking them, but of course they don't have they are idiotics in that case. Uh, they don't have a clue about that. Or maybe they also cannot follow me. Um, I say, you have to deal with a digital quantitative system. Try to employ a team of smart mathematicians 
that set up, that simulate our system, because it is possible, I know it, um, also quantitatively and, um, and, and scientifically, to basically, you, you should have run in your, in your lab, basically, a, a copy of our social system that's out there, our social digital system. And here you can try out what could be the parameters that could steer, that could control that system, not only from a legal perspective, but from a systemic perspective. So for example, uh, one idea that I have, and Jaron Lanier from the US has a similar idea, although he comes from a different path. He says, we should sell our data. We, I say, yes, I also want to see money for my data, but not only be, because I want to be a capitalist and I want to support the system, but because my data have ethic value. And you, Google and Facebook and whoever, you don't pay for my ethic value, but also my work, my labor is being paid, so pay me also, please, for my data. And I know that such payment is a quantitative input that somehow leads to a control of this quantitative digital system. We can probably mimic or simulate the effects. So we can basically also understand from a scientific mathematical standpoint how this system works and how we could implement security measures here by trying it out. At the moment we have nothing, we have the reality, but we do not have it a simulation um, model that mimics the system in the lab, but we should have, I guess. Um, Any remarks? <laughs> Wait, were you referring to, to the whole social system or to, like, like, I can see how you can perhaps simulate as a, as a limited experiment certain... <laughs> no, no, you can simulate much. You use learning machines, it is, you yeah, can simulate things which you would deem yeah. being too complex. Mm -hmm. uh, we do this every day, it's our business for 20 years, so... Uh, <laughs> I, I encourage to really think yeah. it over. It would be a, certainly a huge system, and of course it is more difficult yeah. to model social systems, much more difficult. It's, it's all, therefore, it's more difficult to model a financial market as a social system. It shows a different behavior than weather. Yeah? Weather is a, 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 physical, a, a physics system yeah. which you... With, which is not so chaotic. It is, it is chaotic, but a, 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 a social system is more chaotic. I'd say, because uh, social behavior changes over time. It's non-stationary, as we call it. Um, but it's not impossible. And um, in such system, you could model also such unforeseen events. Uh, you could give it, assign it a certain probability, so these black swans that I have, that we blow up completely, for example, in, in our financial system because it's been hacked. Um, and you could at least uh, get a, a, an understanding of what can happen and how eventually you can protect or prevent, not fully, because if a black, black swan occurs, the damage is huge. Think of Fukushima, a black swan is three of these things blow up and you have three times Kernschmelz, I don't know the, the English term. Uh, this was never somehow in the plan, but the, the, basically the, the, the effects, the, the damage is enormous if such black swan occurs. But at least if you would have a, a simulation model of the digital, it's, it's very wide, I know, the digital uh, revolution we're in, you could at least get a slight idea where, it, where you are very vulnerable and how you eventually could control the system, which parameters you'd have to adjust or to influence to make it work in a specific way. Okay, I would suggest we break out from our four-person system now and uh, open <coughs> the discussion to a wider audience. Uh, if you have questions, please ask them. And if you would uh, ask them to a specific person first, please be specific about that. <coughs> Thank you. Two or three. Um, am I now with this financial market and if it breaks down and, and, and it, it uh, is a big damage for, for all people. I, I had to think about, um, isn't it unsatisfying that we are dependent on money at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are people uh, who, who, for example, live without money. And could, could you give this a chance? Could you, for, uh, on the long term maybe, how do you think about that? 
Well, sure. I mean, this is a, uh, uh, well, how I would respond to your previous comments as well and in answering this question is, is that historically that's precisely what we've seen. We have actually seen whole communities that uh, uh, move away, move out of whatever this broad social system is construed as. So we have seen this historically. We have seen people uh, uh, step, you know, today we just use this concept of just going off the grid, right? And there, there still exists entire communities that do that. So I wonder about this. I wonder how far that kind of adjustment will go um, and how far you know, these entire communities actually move away from that and, and just go away. We might see whole movements, whole social and political movements that uh, simply opt out of, of engaging in a uh, financial structure like this. They don't use money. They, don't, they limit their technologies. They do... Um, uh, they really approach things in a, in a different way. This is uh, certainly possible. And so then, it may not be part of the equation. Um, I'm not wholly familiar with, uh, with this issue, but I think there are already experiments with, with alternative, alternatives to money in, in, in certain cyberspace models. I'm not quite sure, but... but and maybe Bitcoin is just, just the same thing in, in, <laughs> in virtuality, but, but I think there are experiments with, uh, you know, alternative forms of exchange, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't have the crystal guard, the crystal ball, so we do not know what the future will bring. If we look back historically, we have seen that first industrial revolution, the monarchies have went under, basically. Um, so we do not know what future will bring, and I'm really looking forward to what this will all do to our society. And there might be very creative models, like you just suggested. Um, I know, by the way, physicists who are working with, uh, who have the idea and have issued papers for Gleichgewichtsgeld, and it's quite a pretty fancy idea, having money, but it's a, a very different type of money. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really anxious how this will all turn out. I mean, what we are really living in historic changes, I think. In, it's, it's historic times, so we will see. I think nobody has... We see the, the, dio the, the diagnosis on the issues that, we, that we're facing here with the digital revolution and uh, surveillance, etc., PP. It's pretty complete, but no, no one of us has, has any solution and, and, and can give you a, a recipe for the future. We don't know. I'm not sure that money is the issue at all, but probably it's more power in general, and money is just an expression of power at the end. And the question is if the expression is uh, adequate to the concept of human dignity and equality. Uh, when I when I uh, hear your, uh, your comments to the situation, I um, have the, the impact that um, uh, our global systems uh, are uh, highly risky, <coughs> highly unstable. And um, I just want to know um, from all of you three, um, do you think that, that must be now the time to think radical new ideas to bring in in uh, the global dialogue to, to change something and to, to, uh, to, to change it for the better maybe for, for, for the, the generations to come actually? I think that's the whole issue of how change should proceed. Should it be radical change or should it be, you know, stepwise change. Um, I think there's, I, I don't think there's a straightforward answer to this, if, if you know if you, which way is better, you know, proposing radically new ideas or doing, going it step by step. But in general, I think proposing new ideas is a pretty good idea. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I mean, a lot of the discussion is quite pessimistic uh, today, but and I wonder if, if, it, if it's in every area, if this, so, this extent of pessimism, pessimism is really uh, justified, or if, you know, at what, at what point, or at some point maybe we, we can also see that, okay, things do actually move in a, in a, in a certain direction that is um, better, or that makes things better, and um, 
I'm not so I'm not so sure. Maybe it's it's a bit speculative, but you know, with climate change, there was there was nothing. It, it for for some years now, it looked as if it was would going would go to nowhere. The whole international negotiations, and now it, it's moving a bit. It's probably not enough, but <laughs> at least there is some sort of movement, and maybe yeah, maybe there's there's still grounds to be not too pessimistic about the possibility to change things, actually. I think one of the key questions we have to ask ourselves is uh, how should a society look like we want to live in, in the future? Uh, do we want to keep pluralism? Then we probably need privacy. Uh, in the sense that we can develop different ideas, that we can also take paths which, where we fail and nobody recognizes. So we need this sort of protected environment. And then we, want, we, need, we would need to, to, to protect it. Um, or do we want to live in a society that's been controlled, surveilled and controlled? And the bad thing is, and this is also pessimistic, but this, this is the feedback that I get from, from people. There are many people and an increasing number of people who say, that's good that we're all being surveyed, and it's good that we all get to some level of conformism, is this the word? Um, so that there is no Ausreißer, um, no exception, basically. So all people are basically equal, normal partner, we call them. So they're all acting according to specific norm. Um, many people say this in the meantime, and they assume that in that case they would have no uh, criminals anymore. Um, and I think that's, uh, and if I think back also, 25 years ago, the Berlin Wall fell. And those people were living in exactly such an environment and in exactly such a uh, society where they had been surveyed and nobody had to just put their head off, uh, up. And um, they didn't want that. They wanted to have the freedom rights. So obviously it was not their uh, first choice for a society, but I see that we're actually step, stepping back into this weird ideas of, uh, yeah, that's been good that we're all being surveyed and nobody can basically uh, put up his head and say, ooh, boo, huh? I'm a terrorist <laughs> or whatever. So I, I think it's the wrong approach. And we have to make decisions, and therefore I think it's, it's important that we talk to people, and the political work, political work is important. We have to, uh, to make people aware uh, about this discussion and that most of them don't really think over what impact it has if they uh, if they use these um, the, the, the basically the spies in your in your pocket yeah they don't have any idea what impact that has on the society on the legislation on the legal system they just use it uh, but uh, giving them some awareness that we're changing things using this type of technology and everything that's behind the glass the artificial intelligence. Um, that's that should be one of our major tasks. Yeah, I I, I agree wholly with what you've said. And and if I think back in uh, how uh, positive change you know was made historically and things like that, uh, often we uh, what we see is we see these very small incremental steps, and then all of a sudden there's a big change. So uh, we just have to keep working. This is this is what I think. That's what we're here for actually. Yeah. We heard a lot of the necessity to, to, that the government supports industry. As a part, I have the question, what do you mean about open resources? For example, uh, in the internet, we have uh, the Freifunk uh, organization in, in Germany. Uh, if uh, there's a chance to, to get more security in the internet, for example, in science, I'm, uh, in, I'm uh, uh, in the educational area, and we have a lot of open educational resources at the moment. What do you think about the chances to uh, that these uh, things develop more things for freedom than your military uh, ex uh, expansions? Well, 
Well, I see, for example, that um, internet is being used, um, open discussions on the internet are being used for more democracy, which is a pretty much a pirate thing, basically, to have open governments, etc., PP, uh, to facilitate discussions. I'm not very sure whether it's easier to facilitate uh, political developments, uh, opening up uh, in infrastructures or discussions. It's um, I mean, why do we have parties? We have parties because we basically want to facilitate opinion making, right? So uh, that's the reason. Um, it's a little bit actually against your pirate um, idea initially because uh, I think you'd uh, better use these open, open governmental things. But I think it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, for example, when I, when I put on my technology head and I think of open software, for example, then I also see it's not so open <laughs> in the sense um, that it is openly controlled by everybody. It's, this is not the case. You always have a few people who do most of the work and some others contribute, so you also have a concentration of people there. And um, will, that, will that contribute to more freedom? I'm not sure. I think we have to try it out. I mean, there are... That there are approaches to this. I see it. Open government is an approach, but um, we have to try it out because we don't have enough uh, data points yet to to make a, an analysis, basically, on this. Uh, will it work or no? I think we have to try it out for a few years, and then we collect some experience with it, and 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 then figure out, yeah, does it contribute to more freedom or to more safety or whatever. So I think the data points we have now are just not enough to make up our minds. I have a question. Um, in two weeks' time, we have the, the official, so to say, security conference here in Munich. And I, I understand from your talk, uh, talk, Professor Imre, that they anyway don't do their job. So what would be uh, your recommendation from all of you, from the three of you, to, to that conference, just go home or do the job. <laughs> I guess it depends on the mood I'd be in, right? <laughs> <laughs> in the morning, go home, get out of here. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, what we're actually seeing is we see a lot of security theater. And, and uh, for me, uh, somebody who, who analyzes these things and looks at how terrorist movements develop and, and so on and so forth, what I talked about earlier, uh, I think that this sort of security theater business is, is a complete waste of time. So it, in that sense, the answer to your question is yes. You just go home and, and forget about it because this is not contributing anything. It is not contributing anything except for you know sucking up taxpayers' dollars and then uh, making me stand in line every time I want to get on a damn plane. That's it. So uh, on the one hand, it's that. And of course, there are a number, there are a myriad of ways to look at this. On the other hand, uh, there are real security problems. You know, there are real sorts of circumstances that we need to analyze and look at and think about and, and that kind of a thing. Um, but I'm quite cynical about uh, about whether or not you know these are, are really being done, because once we get into a conversation about um, uh, what sort of uh, technology, you know, something like this, uh, uh, how to create the best facial recognition technology so as to match your face with your passport face to make sure that you are really you. Once we go down this track of getting involved in in that sort of conversation, uh, I think actually that's a complete waste of time. Um, that's not really addressing the uh, underlying problems of what it is that we want to actually achieve in a society when we talk about security. So it's, this is a difficult one to think about and try and um, bring out some positive aspects of what it is that we ought to be doing when we're thinking about th this kind of security. I think the security conference is R uses also um, a platform for information exchange, and therefore I think it has some value. So of course you leave the conference and you don't have tangible decisions. 
usually, right? But at least you know a little bit more what's going on in the world. So I once participated in one, and it was about the um, the, the the energy in the world, the change of um, how how oil. So for me, that was uh, it was about fracking basically, yeah? and, and 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 the hypothesis was that it was two years ago. So the hypothesis was uh, that very soon the U.S. would be independent from importing oil. And I was not very familiar with the topic. For me, it was quite interesting to hear that. And for the first time, I, I've heard that hypothesis. And now you basically must say, uh, actually, it, they were right. OK, it was not so much forecasting. Actually, it was very close already to the reality. Um, you, you learn something, and you, you, you consider it with your then cons for considerations for at your specific work, so where you can change the world, in quotation marks, is only in your specific <coughs> tiny environment. But uh, for this, you need to make informed decision, and you need you have information. And uh, so basically, it's good to participate in information hubs, uh, where you get information that is really reliable, because you know the source where it's from, it might be an original source, basically. So if you sit with, the, sit with these people who do fracking, or fracking businesses, or uh, who, do, uh, who are in oil, then this is more credible than getting second or third hand information only from the internet by browsing, for example. So I think that you should have reliable information for decision making, how to deal with complex environments we're in, and uh, therefore it's helpful. I mean, not for really tangible decisions. I think I agree. It's 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 pretty much about expectation management in a way, and um, I think especially concerning the real pressing security problems and other things, there I think there there are profound disagreements also between attendants, and I think the such such a format as this conference is useful to the extent that it facil facilitates or that it provides a platform for dialogue and. And, but it also depends on, on the po po possibility to, to you know, to discuss controversial things and to, to voice disagreements. If it's just if all agree, then you you don't need to go there. If, if it's just consensus, yeah, you can save your tax money. But as a as a platform for a dialogue, I think it's well worth it actually. I really hate to be the game killer, but uh, we're already a little bit over time. So I would probably ask all three of you for some closing words and hope for that uh, those are not really closing words but like uh, skimming for further discussion later on because uh, after that we have to go on with the next presentation. <laughs> Don't be too pessimistic. I also tend to be pessimistic with regard to all this but I generally I'm optimistic and I want to also keep up that optimism for uh, where we stand. Now we have seen, we have managed so many historic uh, challenges and there is a chance that we can manage this also, the digital transformation, um, but enforce our leaders, leaders in quotation marks, um, enforce, go there, fordere ein deine Rechte, go and drive them and tell them I have fundamental rights and give me an infrastructure that is compliant with my fundamental rights and with the institution, uh, with the constitution. This is what we should get out from our existing politicians, leaders, as I said, in quotation marks. There are, I fully agree, Nemi, with you because I see with uh, Mrs. Merkel, she's doing a lot of surveys. This is very well known. And then, then she basically gets the results from the service. She's not leading. She's, <laughs> she's, so basically, we are leading, and she's following us. And it gives her votes, obviously. And that's the way how we are being led. This is uh, also something I would disagree with strongly. But we have, we have also power. As I said, every click that we make uh, and, and Amazon, when we do the one click buy or whatever, we enforce a specific business model or idea of making business. But we have the power not to do this and to refuse. And this is what we should think of. Thank you. Well, um, just quickly, I, th I think a lot of people are here because you're interested in new ideas and in developing new ideas. And I think that's actually, that, that's something that you should go on with. It's, it's, that's what we need. Right? I'll say one last thing very quickly. 
Um, uh, I, I teach and research at uh, uh, universities. That's my job. I'm an academic. And I think the idea of the university is not yet dead. And so uh, uh, at the risk of being an optimist, uh, that's, that's what I do. I, I go there, uh, create courses, uh, teach people about a whole variety of things. You know, how, how uh, if we're talking about security, uh, how it, security is a, is a historical concept. Uh, if we're talking about terrorist organizations, how terrorist organizations came about and developed. If we're talking about technology, we talk about the history of technology and how all these things move and develop and change over time. Uh, so I think that's, that's a, a very valuable thing. And I think uh, uh, we should just keep working at these kinds of things. And this is why this is such an important forum as well. OK, then thank you very much. Um, so we are going to just rebuild the stage for the next presentation. Uh, just a short remark, if you read the documents in your presentation um, folder, there is an error. Everything today will be happening on this stage today. There will be no, no event on stage two. So um, just stay in the room, or if you have to go to the toilet, then go, but come back soon. <laughs>